Hello, um, welcome to this exclusive Telegraph subscriber event. Telegraph presents Behind the Scenes at Guys and Dolls with Arlene Phillips. My name is Claire Orfrey. I'm a journalist with The Telegraph, and it's a huge pleasure to host this event, being both a fan of Guys and Dolls and, of course, of Arlene herself. Before we begin, a tiny bit of housekeeping. I think on your video screen, if you press a small square in the right-hand corner, you should be able to enlarge it. And also, thank you to subscribers who've already submitted some questions. We will do our best to get through as many of them as possible. But first of all, let me introduce Arlene Phillips, who I'm not really sure needs much introduction. But <laughs> anyway, she's a choreographer to the stars. She has worked with Ben Elton and Freddie Mercury. Uh, she was the first person to choreograph Starlight Express after a producer saw you skating seven months pregnant. Is that correct? Um. Well, sort yes, you could attach lines. that to the story, <laughs> yes, definitely. Nonetheless, huge triumph. Yeah. Um, and of course, now a doyen of West End Musical Theatre. So let's start with Guys and Dolls. And I wonder yes. if we ought to maybe just very quickly summarise the musical for people who might not know. It's based on the stories by Damon Runyon, isn't yes. it? It's set yes. in the 1920s New York. It's got a terrific cast of gamblers and hustlers. Yes. And it's also a love story. Is that yeah. a fair summation? I think he did. <laughs> definitely a love story. It's definitely a love story. And um, the book is definitely set in the 20s, the books mm -hmm. are. Uh, but the musical, Guys and Dolls, um, was written about the 50s. That's right, yes. yes. Great, yes. And it's a hugely loved musical, isn't it? I don't know anybody who doesn't like Guys and Dolls. I mean, what is its charm and its appeal, do you it, think? It's so remarkable because since um, I, it's been announced, I, I'm working on Guys and Dolls, the number of people of all ages mm. who have said, it's my favourite musical. I had no idea it's everyone, it appears to right. be favourite musical. I had no idea. I thought it was just mine and my family because I brought my daughters up on it. And I, and I think of the many, many summer days we spent running around on the trampoline singing, oh. the got a horse ride. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's captivating. Yeah. Musically, story-wise, uh, it's funny, it has mm. great sense of humour. The, 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 the structure of, of the writing and mm. these interesting stories just grabs you. Yeah. And now yeah. I realise, of course, it's everyone's mm. favourite musical. Mm. It's quintessentially American, isn't it? As you say, it's set in the 1920s, very much in New York. You couldn't really take it out of New York. It would be very hard to do. I did see a show that moved it like a mile up the road to Harlem at Manchester Royal Exchange a few years ago. But yes. nonetheless, it's quintessentially American. I wondered whether you had any more general thoughts on why the British have totally fallen in love with this American art form. You know, what it is about the musical in general, you know, the Broadway musical that we just can't get enough of in this country. I think the thing about the typical Broadway legendary musicals is that in, in many ways, there's always a romance, mm. there's always danger, um, and there are quite obviously full out performances, mm. artists on stage giving everything to captivate the audience and bring them into the story that evolves. Mm. Um, they unashamedly sing and dance as part of the story. And I think worldwide, people have fallen of what we originally think of as the typical Broadway musical. I'm gonna start just doing it vocally. So let's just go into the vocals and then bit by bit, we'll do section by section. <laughs> Take it, I'm going to take it. I love you, I'm going to 
So um, I think everyone on the, all the speech, I think it's a bit too timid yeah. at the moment. So I, I can't actually hear the words as well. So you really, you've taken the note really well on low in the voice. <laughs> yeah. But now I think we've got to find a, a bit of higher resonance um, in addition. So rather than about you, it's just, it, it, it's not going to read at all at the moment. So the, the, yeah, so the first note is just, just, just basic projection, I think. And then I think you can just get a, a, a bit of high ping in it, so it's not all dull about you. About mm -hmm. you, so it just needs a little bit of... Mm -hmm. you, can we just do that first one? Um, I think it will help also in this, in our Bushel and Pet, where this audience, these screaming guys, both, you know, at the table of the thing, are your real audience. And so all of those about you, it's about or about you, they're all out to people. And the whole thing is like, we're here, you are damn lucky to be here watching us in this show. So it, it, the whole thing has to resonate as one person, not changing, you know, from the carrots to the beginning, to then this low about you, you it, um, then the dance bit. It all has to feel like one person doing it. Mm -hmm. And each person is, is an, individual, an, an individual within this whole thing. So it's about your different personalities. You know, who wears boots, who wears shoes, who's in bare feet, kind of, mm -hmm. who am I here tonight performing for you at the hot box? And so it has one tone yeah. of strength and power all the way through it. Yeah. And, and a slight darkness in that sense of mm -hmm. these girls have got, you know, living two lives. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, with, it, with the first about you, I mean, ha think about a different intention that's not, because just about you on its own is so obscure to think about, isn't it? If you think, like, think about something like, I'm going to eat you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. I'm going to eat you. Something like that. Give yourself intention for those lines. Yeah. Let's just do the first two and then I'll I'll put the way on. So this is Baron and he found talking in my sleep. Oh one, two, three, four. Baron and he found talking in my sleep about you. About you. One more of those. It's brilliant yeah. about you, and then let's go on as well. Yeah. and dance or think of ourselves as people who could sing and dance yes. and there's something about that transporting combination of the two movement yeah. and song that you know there's nothing yes. like it yes you get totally as an audience member committed to what you're seeing mm. and hearing mm -hmm. and you always take a part of that musical home with you because in some ways there's always a song still yeah. in your ears mm. or or there's, there's a moment that happens that is of either great beauty or it's a sorrow. There's always something you take away. So a little bit of every musical you yeah. see is left inside you. Yes. It becomes part of you. Yes. 
And on you, as, as, as a girl who I know dreamed of being a ballet dancer, growing up in Manchester, and then coming to London, and then uh, training here, and then setting up your own dance troupe, and then moving into music videos before moving into choreography, how much influence did the Broadway musical have on you? And I don't know how much influence Guys and Dolls might have had on you, or maybe that was a show you encountered later. The musical that changed my life was West Side Story. Oh, right. Until seeing West Side Story as in my teens in Manchester, I had wanted to be a classical dancer. There was nothing else in my life. I lived for ballet. That's all I ever wanted to do. And the, the two things happened. One was that my mother passed away when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And the realization with the, having a younger sister and a father who was not in good health was I was never going to get to London to, to, to reach my dreams, which was to study at a dance school mm -hmm. in London. Um, uh, but also, I saw West Side Story and it changed my thinking. Right. It changed everything. It was the most wonderful musical that I wanted to know, to mm -hmm. live in. Mm -hmm. I've even got the, the old book you could buy, the paperback. Actually, when I look at it, it's thumbed and, right. you know, sang all the songs. Uh, it, was, it was everything. So I think the Broadway musical, without question, changed my life and right. changed my desire. And so let's just talk a little bit, because you did start off, I know, uh, directing music videos. So did the Broadway musical influence that at all? Or did that come later that you were able to express that particular love for that form in your later part of your career? Um, I, because of seeing West Side Story, I had mm. fallen in love with modern jazz, if you mm. like. Mm. Um, I then decided that I wanted to make my career in being able to create musicals like West Side Story. Right. It, was, it was such a dream because I became a teacher. Yes. I was teaching dance, but you would use the influences of the things I had seen. I eventually came to London and became a teacher in London. It was the only thing I knew how to do mm -hmm. and took the best uh, of my pupils to form a dance group, which I called Hot Gossip, Indeed. because I wanted them to dance in a dramatic style, not the way I saw dance on television, which was lots of lovely dancers and quite brilliant, mm. but always smiling. Yes, it's very and such a rick to smile. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And, and never uh, did I feel that there was a story right. as in a musical. Right. So I formed a group, Hot Gossip, um, which for three years I was teaching and had hot gossip. Mm -hmm. And then a director came along who saw a photograph of hot gossip and said, I want them on TV, I'm doing a new That's television right. show. Mm. It was with him I got into music videos right. because right. it was the start of MTV mm -hmm. and the company I worked with, MGM MM, was one of the first companies set up to make music videos for MTV, this new way of, of creating yeah. and thinking about how you promote records. Mm -hmm. And I was involved with the company with all the directors there. And so I started choreographing some of the very first musicals ever wow. seen on MTV. Wow. And that's how my career went from hot gossip to music musical. videos, right. musical theatre hadn't entered into my world no, as yet. Later. Okay. Yes, lovely. But it was because the TV shows that I was doing and putting on um, uh, in this comedy show mm -hmm. gave me an opportunity not just to t film a whole day on one three-minute number with huge sets, t teaching me about television and how to direct and create for television, right, right. but also the success of Hot Gossip. Literally, my, my world just opened up. Completely changed. The girls themselves in the hot box are pretty powerful. People come to this 
club. They come to the hot box because these girls don't dance like anywhere else. They can go to all the other clubs. They can go and see the Rockettes. It doesn't, they've got all of these nice girls. They come because these girls have got a drive, which I think a good way to think about it is you, you're independent women. You know, you work at the hot box because this is your choice. And I, th and I think it's the sort of change of what we see now. You don't want to be the little wives, any, you know, the little wives, the nice gir girlfriends, the dolls on the, the arms of the men. You are the dolls, but you're, you're the first generation that's fighting for women's independence. So that people come here because they see the power of the women. There's no messing. They're not, you know, little chi -chi 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 girls. So I think you're a force for change. So if you dance with that attitude of great, of independence, of style, of ownership. I mean, I, I always look at, um, you know, that Ma Rainey film really kind of opened my eyes that no one was going to mess with her. And she came out to sing, she came out to sing, and everyone in that room had to look at her. And I think it's that kind of intensity, which at that time people were afraid of. And you don't want to be the little, the glamour girls in the movies. You want more than that. So I think, think of it as the first step to women being independent and the power that that brings and the force that that brings. So here in the Hot Box Club, people talk about it. You know, people talk about it. You know, when I first had my dance group, Hot, Hot Gossip, that I created, because every time I turn on my TV on Saturday night, there would be lovely dancers always smiling. No matter what they did, they had a smile on their face. And I kept thinking, why are they smiling? Why do they constantly smile? This number has passion and drive, and, but never sh showed it. And then I started this group, which were kind of really out there, independent, sexy girls and males um, fighting for change, fighting for something different in the world of dance, because there were all these amazing dance companies. But when it came to any clubs or TV, it was all very, very nice and jolly and friendly. And I think it's that, you know, it's, I think we can imagine these hot box girls were the first generation of that. Cool. Of just look at us because we're strong and we have power over ourselves. We're not beholden to any men. We're not beholden. And if, you know, and if this audience is here cheering you on, that's the audience you want. So with Guys mm. and Dolls, how have you approached the choreography for that? Have you drawn, I mean, there've been many, many productions of Guys and Dolls, yes. haven't there? And of course there was the film. Yes. So have you been influenced by the, the, the different choreogra choreographers who have worked on the show or have you tried to start again? There are so many phenomenal productions of mm. Guys and Dolls that I've seen again and again. Most of them rooted in the very original creation of a 50s-style jazz musical, brilliant, mm -hmm. with numbers performed mostly um, on stage, the cross arch, and each one absolutely riveting and generating mass applause for the audience. Mm -hmm. Here, working with Nick Heitner and mm. following in the famous works he's done on the immersive productions of, of Julius Caesar, yes. followed by A Midsummer Night's Dream, oh, which was I was terrific. first involved right. in. Yes, that was a brilliant And show. now, Guys and Dolls. Lovely. So we're starting off with the premise, this as an immersive musical involved, involving the audience will no longer be staged in the way the original musical right. is usually done, right. but helping the audience to follow with you the New York streets and the buzz ah, of the New York streets to take them to Havana. So it's 
it's rooted in a very, very different way yeah. of performing Guys and Dolls. So within that, choreographically, first of all, we are using four sides of right. the space. Wow. We are using a set that comes up, it's there for you. The audience will kind of move in in certain areas and then they'll move out and it's ever changing, oh, it's levels. So by way of the, the nature of what is being done has to be different. Yes, of course. And what I found in watching what led by Nick has been created, mm -hmm. and I'm working together with the phenomenal James Cousins who I've worked with before, mm -hmm. and we're working together on this, mm -hmm. is that it never stops. Right. It never stops, it will stop when Let's say we go to the hot box uh, okay. uh, where Miss Adelaide performs with her dancers. Mm -hmm. They are performance numbers. Yeah. So it stops. But otherwise, everything familiar, is part right. of the story. Wow. So those characters that you see playing these roles um, never stop right. because they're in and out, they're up, they're down. Um, so the form of it is so different mm -hmm. that, it, that it naturally changes the shape okay. of guys and dolls. Fantastic. You've got audience everywhere. So now be sure that you never just kind of dance it or you're slightly looking down because you're, it's like you're all on stage this way, but then you're all on stage this way. And so even though the audience um, is below you, they they're not that low you know they only look you know they're looking up at you like this so make sure that all your eyes are always focused on the audience for every piece of choreography choreography you do don't just ever just um don't just ever just dance it it's always for someone Tell us a little bit about the Hot Box Girls. And, yes. and there, there's two key scenes, I believe. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes, yes. And two, two big numbers. Two big numbers. Two absolutely. big numbers. So, uh, Miss Adelaide works, she is the star of the Hot Box mm -hmm. Club. And this is a club that mainly men went to see the women. Mm -hmm. um, and they always had a musical number set to a premise and then that number unfolds. Right. Um, and in some ways they're definitely provocative, mm -hmm. but in looking at today, and looking at theatre today, mm -hmm. um, I've always been involved in empowering women. Yes. I am very, very a strong supporter of women making their own rules. Right. Um, and so what I wanted for the hot box, and generally it's a group of dancers who are everything but the rockettes, but yes. they're um, rockettes in, the, in their dream. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of identical, typical Broadway 50s dancers. I wanted very, very individual dancers right um, okay. so, um, not an ensemble, so it's but, not right. an ensemble yeah. it's these power power women who each have their own dreams and their own stories mm -hmm. and again we look to the damon runyon books to take at those stories and could you be whatever the, their name was working at the hot box so right. they all have a story behind them. They all have right. something to come together with. Yes. So our numbers are are strong in their storytelling. Right. And they're right. strong in the the power of the women. Wow. And and Miss Adelaide. Yes. Played by the brilliant she Marisha Wallace. Is who is isn't she? She's captivating. Terrific. Yes. So have you worked with Marisha before? No. Right, so no. tell me about that, because I saw her in Hairspray and she was just amazing. And of course Oklahoma, where and of course Oklahoma. she's just, yes. you know, yes. uh, five stars, five yeah. stars every time anyone mentions her name. She's just joyful. I mean, she's, she's not a kid, mm. but she's like 
a delightful teenager. Yeah. She is so loving and giving uh, her voice. I can, I can honestly say she opens her mouth to sing and I have goosebumps. Right. It's yes. one of those voices yeah. that just reaches under your skin. Mm -hmm. um, she's delightful to work mm -hmm. with and she's very strong and powerful and powerful as a woman mm. and but also as Miss Adelaide. Yes, so because Miss Adelaide could be seen as a bit of a victim, couldn't she? Uh, yes. I mean, she's hanging around, she's yes. waiting for this engagement. Yeah. She's told her mum she's already engaged yeah. to Nathan or married even, they've yeah. got five children. <laughs> None of these things have happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's developed this terrible cold as a yeah. sort of, you know, consequence of this endless waiting. Yes. So what does Marisha yes. do with this character? She takes her as a life force right yes she's waiting and waiting and waiting for him mm. and she's sobbing over him she is so in love and she admits she's so in love but she also finds well i need to do something about this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's a little twist at the end which is so delightful so delightful. I don't want to give it no, away because fine. I want everyone to yeah. see it. Mm. But there is a twist where she just comes into yeah, her own yeah, yeah. and you want to clap and cheer. Yeah, yeah. Um, because not just for the character, and it's very, very... When you look at it, you go, of course, that's the answer. Yeah. But also because for Marisha that just plays Adelaide uh, as the woman everyone will want to be. Yes. Will yeah. just want to yeah. be where there's yeah. that twist and she clicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you do that, you know, goodbye. Yeah. Kind of a bit more statue. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. And then have the hand turned inwards. Bye. And the Statue of Liberty Hotel. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell me a bit about how it, how you are in the rehearsal room. What is the rehearsal space for you? It's it's very very interesting. When I think back to the musicals I've worked on mm -hmm. and how there was, in my own training, real discipline. I mean, right. you know, all those stories of cane-banging uh, teachers and choreographers, they're true. Right. They're true. Mm -hmm. um, we would never today treat dancers in the way that I was taught. Oh, um, and also, you know, just in terms of my body, mm. um, a girl never, a female never got to wear knee pads, but you had to do knee slides and knee drops and, you know, knee pads were for the guys. Right. You know, it, it's just so weird to think back of the way we were treated and accepted. And I suppose when I first started, I was that same kind of, disciplinarian mm -hmm. um, but understanding myself and how I wanted to take power and control for the many particularly musicals I work with with an all-male team mm. um, you know that often I found unruly and I felt like I've got to come on you know yeah. but I found my way and my method in a room has 
completely changed in that right. sense of it's a, been a turnaround and it's like, don't demand what you want from people. How do you find that they want the same right. thing? Right. So I'm much quieter in a room <laughs> than I ever was okay. before. Okay. Much quieter. Um, and far more patient, okay. far more patient. Maybe that just comes with age well, anyway. But I think in the rehearsal room, I'm quiet. I'm giving, I often go around one-to-one, -one giving like something that will affect them, but not the whole room and make everybody okay. stand there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm certainly not the Arlene I was. Right, that's interesting. And have you found that a more effective way to be in the rehearsal room? I think... 90% is more effective, 10% okay. still doesn't work. Right, you right. Know, well, you probably... ten, your 10% <laughs> is like, okay, what do you need me to do or say to get you there? Yeah, okay. Um, and it's weird, you know, so many of the people that I've worked with, old school style, who have mm. actually become quite remarkably famous, right. have all thanked me, every single one of them for what I gave them, because I gave yeah, so much of myself right. in yeah. terms of pushing them to be um, more than they ever dreamed. Often, ensemble, you hear they've got an incredible voice. They can act, they can dance, but they think of themselves mainly as a dancer. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, uh, they don't realize how far they can go. So a lot of people right. I've pushed yes, yeah. to realize the gift they have and use it right um but i think that yeah for mostly i find it a good way of working okay that's interesting yeah because i think a, the sort of the common criticism of british musical theatre performers was that they didn't have that work ethic and the discipline of, of the americans but i think that has changed quite a bit hasn't it i mean i think drama schools are now taking musical theatre much more seriously yes. um, there's a lot more emphasis on studying it at drama school mm. and i think a lot of that might have to do with andrew lloyd webber is that is that fair uh, to say <laughs> yes well let just for a moment leave andrew lloyd webber aside Okay. But absolutely, you are right. Um, the change in the standard and what we are producing here now has been enormous. Mm -hmm. When I first went to Broadway to do my first musical, which was Starlight Express, mm -hmm. and we auditioned um, in Las Vegas, in Los Angeles, in New York, open auditions, agents' auditions, and the standard was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. I worked with a lot of the Fosse dancers. Mm. I worked mm. on commercials in New York. Mm -hmm. And I found when I did my first musical that they would all be at a class early morning. Yes. Then, bef before they came into rehearsal, we're then um, expecting a full warm-up, mm -hmm. disciplined, focused, demanding on themselves. It was so different mm -hmm. and could dance anything you gave them, yeah. you know, including acrobatics as, yeah. as just a, a natural wider aspect of their, all of the genres that they needed to have to mm -hmm. be in a Broadway musical. I definitely found that Cats changed all of that ah, because right. that is very, very difficult choreography, Gillian Lynn's choreography. Yes. So suddenly the dancers became the stars and therefore in becoming the stars and particularly those who could sing and dance, mm -hmm. it sort of developed from there that, that there are many, many styles that you need to dance and bit by bit, slowly by slowly now, we have some of the best triple yes. threats and more right. because many of them do about 15 or 16 different genres of dance they may yeah, need yeah. as mm. well as right. a singer, actor. Mm. And also the demands today is a dancer never just dances. Mm. They have to be able to tell a story. Yes, so course. therefore, this is why drama schools are expanding ever wider mm -hmm. because dancing isn't just steps. No. And, and again, you, in Guys and Dolls, you'll see how involved everyone is, both the dancers and non-dancers, yes. that they can you know, meld together because it's about storytelling. Absolutely. And you have yeah. to be a storyteller. Yeah, yeah. 
There's a lot of demand on people yeah. in musical theatre today. Yeah. One little timing thing, we're all slightly, slightly out with each other, but that time, really good, really good. Lots of attitude, which is what makes it work. Yeah. Go from, yeah. Five, six, seven, five, and five, 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 five,
Absolutely kills Wouldn't you. Yeah, kill you. Mm. Yeah, and and that's what I want. Right. That's what I want to yeah. say. This is who we are. Look at us. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. I am bold. Yeah. I am brave. I am everything I want to be. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a better proponent of that than Marisha Wallace, to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> she is right out there. <laughs> She's terrific. Yeah. Um, we've got a few subscriber questions. Yes. So um, let me just call those up. Um, so Andrew wanted to know why Guys and Dolls in 2023? And has there been any particular change of emphasis, either from yourself or from Nick or from both of you working together? Well, I say a good musical never dies, whether it's 2023, 33 right. and mm -hmm. on and mm -hmm. on. I think it will go on for decades because mm -hmm. it's not just a good musical. It's mm -hmm. a great musical. But again, um, Nick Heitner had been wanting to do a musical. Midsummer Night's Dream in many ways became a musical because yes. it was so full of music. Yeah. And how in this um, way he's done uh, two Shakespeare's, but how would a musical work mm. in this format? Mm. And Guys and Dolls seem the perfect musical to do because right. it takes you places. It starts in New York. You travel to Havana. Mm. It's it's exciting for an audience to feel like they're coming with you. Yeah. So yes. it seemed the ideal, ideal. musical perfect. and so loved. And so loved. Indeed. And of course, as we were saying, you know, it's a it's a it's a musical in which it's, it's a cliche to say that the, the location of a place is its own character. But I think in this musical, it really is, isn't it? You know, that sort of the atmosphere of that particular moment in New York history and, you know, the, the milieu in which it's set, you know, the gambling dens and the, yes. where the cap games are played. Yes. You know, it's so particular and distinct. It's very interesting because it is about gamblers and mm. it's also the danger of gambling yes because there's no question that gambling is not just an addiction it's mm. a disease mm. and that gamblers that's interesting once once they start mm. they are gripped they mm. are in this unholy alliance with the devil mm. because they can't stop yeah and every win is dangerous yes, because every win means you start again next. until yeah. you lose. So the the gamblers, you know, and the fact that they have to look and, of course, it's quite famously, you know, uh, Guy Masterson mm -hmm. actually it's wants to reform. have his soul mm. saved. Yes. Uh, so there's a message there. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. that everything that carries you along in life can change and change for the better. Yes, lovely. Um, Caroline wanted to know, what is your favourite scene? And I'm really hoping you're going to say, sit down, you're rocking the boat. But you might not say that. <laughs> Isn't sit down, you're rocking oh. the boat everybody's yes. favourite theme? Yes. Everyone has asked me. <laughs> What's um, rocking the boat like? Yeah, how are you doing? And that? of course, you've got Cedric Neal and Amit. You couldn't rock a boat better right. with anyone okay. other than yes. Cedric. Lovely. Okay. So that's your answer. That's your that favourite scene. That is my favourite scene. Because okay. I dance out of rehearsal. Sit <laughs> down, you're rocking. Sit down, you're rocking. Yeah. <laughs> you can't help it. <laughs> Great. Lovely. I hope Caroline agrees with that answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, David wanted to know, um, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to a performer who is looking to make the grade? Somebody oh. just starting out. Gosh. Somebody starting out in musical theatre, like mm. so many now, mm -hmm. has to know that it's everything in their life. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, don't go there. It's hard. Right. It's tough. You face rejection. You have to be able to face rejection. Mm -hmm. But you have to know, I can't live without this. And if you can't live without it, go for it. Put everything into mm -hmm. it. And gosh, whoever that question is from... It's a question I often get asked. Right. And my advice is you have to need it. Okay. Not just want it. Yeah. Need it. Was that the case for you? Oh, <laughs> I never thought about doing anything else. Right. Right. Brilliant. 
Um, and finally, Elizabeth um, wanted to know, if you had your life all over again, is there anything you would change? If I had my life again, and this is my honest answer, I would have spent more time with my girls, my two oh. daughters. It's my honest answer. Oh, that's a very honest answer. I sometimes look back, and thank you for answering, asking that question, because I sometimes look back and I think, did I need to do this? Did I right. need to do that? I, I carried along on this great wave this surfing mm. that goes on and you get asked to do things and, it, mm. and you, you take, I did, took my kids everywhere with mm. me and they, they love their lives. Yes, I'm but sure. for me, I still have that little, uh, should I? Can't have everything. You can't <laughs> have everything, but in many ways, I think I have. Yes, I think you I have I think too. I have. I have two loving girls, two loving dark granddaughters. Right. And I think successful my career, career I, couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything more. Right. I think on that note, <laughs> we will end this. Arlene, thank you so much. Total pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. I think everybody watching this can't wait to see the show. So thank you for, you know, for coming to talk to us about it. And uh, best of luck with the rest of the rehearsals, best of luck with previews, and I hope it goes very well. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you and the questions that both you asked and, the and your readers. Yes. Lovely. Thank you for that. Thank you. Performances for Guys and Dolls at the Bridge Theatre begin from the 3rd of March um, and their best availability is from April. Um, it's worth pointing out that you can book either seated tickets if you just want to remain seated or immersive tickets if you want to get involved. Um, and the website is bridgetheatre.co.uk.